first video that I sent to you. And uh, I will be your host for uh, Science and Spirituality Connection, this uh, symposium that we are putting together. And uh, in that first video, I was explaining to you uh, the motivation for this. Uh, I do volunteer for uh, Mrs. Uh, Sonia Rinaldi, Rinaldi, as you all know, uh, and I explained that in the video. Um, for many, many years, we tried to validate our uh, researches and uh, our results and um, without any success. We tried to invite people for, uh, you know, to, to use some laboratories and scientists, but uh, we didn't have any success on trying to, to, um, to get the scientists uh, working with us. So that's the idea of putting this together. And um, as an engineer, I really wanted to, to, to make that happen. Um, I work as a project manager here in Houston, Texas. And um, uh, well, yeah, we just decided to put this together and, uh, and uh, talk to the scientists, talk to the people working on a, on a spiritual, uh, spiritualistic uh, uh, field, if you will. And, um, um, have just a good uh, conversation. So, the, in, the in this first talk, we'll have, uh, we have the pleasure of having Dr. Larry Dossi with us today. And uh, in, this, uh, in this talk, Dr. Larry Dossi will be talking about his book, Recovering the Soul, uh, Evidences that Consciousness Survives the Death. Um, and uh, as you all know, Dr. Dossi, he is a distinguished Texas uh, physician, deeply rooted in the scientific world. And uh, he has become an, an internationally influential advocate of the role of the mind in health, uh, in health and the role of spirituality in healthcare. He is author of nine books and numerous articles and, uh, and, and and as an engineer, this is really what I'm, uh, uh, why I am a big fan of Dr. Dossi's Dossi, work. Uh, the primary quality of all of Doss, Doss's, Dr. Dossi's work is scientific legitimacy uh, with an insistent focus on what the data shows. So show me the data, this fits me uh, very well. 100% uh, and, and I believe this audience too. And uh, as a result of his focus on scientific legitimacy, his colleagues in the medical schools and hospitals all over the US trust him, honor his message and continually invite him to share his insights with, with, with them. So he has lectured all over the world, including major medical schools and hospitals in United States like Harvard or, or Johns Hopkins or Cornell. Uh, and uh, the impact of Dr. Dossi's work has been remarkable. Um, before his book, and this is really, really interesting, before his book, Healing Words, was published in 1993, only three, only three US medical schools had courses devoted to exploring the role of religious practice and prayer in health. So currently nearly 80 medical schools have instituted such courses, many of which utilize Dr. Doss's work as textbooks. So this is amazing. In his 1989 book, Recovering the Soul, which is the his lecture today, he introduced uh, the concept of non-local mind. Uh, mind unconfined to the brain and body, mind is spread infinitely throughout the space and time. So since then, non-local mind has been adopted by many leading scientists as uh, emerging image of the consciousness. So, so, ladies and gentlemen, with you, Dr. Dossi. So, please go ahead, Dr. Dossi. I hope I did a good job introducing you. <laughs> sure, you did. That was uh, lovely. Thank you for that. Now, let me pull up my uh, lecture here. Okay, everybody. <laughs> well, I uh, am delighted, Anna, for your 
introduction and I am happy to invite all of you into my home, which is uh, in northern New Mexico, just outside the town of uh, Santa Fe. We're going to be talking about, as Anna has already uh, mentioned, uh, a very controversial subject. I'm happy to say that it is becoming less controversial. But back when I was in medical school, back when my hair was black instead of silver, uh, you couldn't talk about the soul or immortality or spirituality. That's the bad news. The good news is that things are changing and they are changing dramatically and very swiftly. Now, recovering the soul suggests that we somehow lost it and we have to go back and try and try to find it. And so that's what we're going to, to explore. How, how would you go about doing that? How do you make a case for the soul in contemporary medicine and contemporary science? Before we embark on our discussion, I think it's a good idea to get some uh, definitions about terms I'll be using uh, during this conversation. I think the soul is that spiritual or immaterial part of a human being or animal that we generally consider to be immortal. Uh, on the other hand, spirituality, which is a term I'm going to be using quite frequently, I believe is a sense of being connected with something higher than the self or the ego, uh, a sense of being united with something absolute or eminent or transcendent, Whatever term you give to that, whether it's God or goddess or just simply the universe. And part of spirituality is the conviction that meaning and value and direction and purpose are valid aspects of this uh, universe we happen to live in. Now, I think most of you will understand that spirituality is not the same thing as religion. Religion is a codified system of belief and worship and conduct. It may involve a sense of the spiritual, or it may not. I'm sure many of you know people who are deeply religious who don't seem to have very much spirituality about their life, and also people who are spiritual who aren't very religious. And religion usually takes place in a group of like-minded believers. Now, the most slippery, difficult to define term I'll be using is consciousness. Uh, there are hundreds of definitions of consciousness. Here's one I think suits our discussion. It's from Dr. Jeffrey Kripal, who is a philosopher at Rice University in Houston, who is the author of numerous books on the subject. His uh, view is this. Consciousness is the fundamental ground of all that we know or that we will ever know. It is the ground of all of the sciences, all of the arts, all of the social sciences, all of the humanities, indeed, all human knowledge and experience. Dr. Kripal goes on to say that those who claim that consciousness is not its own thing, those who claim that consciousness is reducible to warm, wet tissue and brainhood, but to this day, nobody has even come close to showing how this might work probably because it doesn't work. Now, I was uh, heartened to see this cover of the Journal of the American Medical Association, one of the distinguished medical journals in not only America, but the Western world, back in 1991, when it gave us a little hint that maybe things are changing in medicine. Here you have a uh, surgeon who is scrubbed and gloved and gowned and masked about to enter the surgery suite, and he has his hands folded and his head bowed in some sort of prayer. Now, uh, this was an indicator that you can begin to talk about this sort of thing in medical circles. Uh, my wife, Barbara, who is a cardiovascular nurse and prolific author in her field, uh, and I were giving a talk about these spiritual issues and in medicine to a group of surgeons in Tacoma, Washington. And after, after our talk, a female surgeon came up and she said, I would like to share with you two the prayer that I always use before I go into surgery. She said, when I'm gloved and gowned and scrubbed, 
I hold my hands up and I pray, dear God, these are your hands. Now don't go and embarrass yourself. I, I think that's a pretty good surgeon's uh, prayer myself. The point is that this is coming out of the closet and it is no longer taboo to talk about. The reason this is becoming a hot topic in contemporary conventional medicine is because of the data. And the data show conclusively that people who follow some sort of spiritual or religious path in their life, and I have to say, it just doesn't seem to matter which one they pick, but if you pick one and you stick with it, you live on average seven to 13 years then longer, longer than people who do not follow a religious path. And in the process, you have a lower incidence of all the major diseases, including heart disease and cancer. And I think it's becoming clear to the faculty in most of our medical schools that the difference that spirituality makes in health is so profound that we are no longer justified in ignoring it. Now, we have to be careful here because if you look at the data carefully, you can see that being spiritual or following a religious path it's not a guarantee that you're going to live seven to 13 years longer. These are averages, and there are exceptions to this. Uh, many years ago, I, I made a long list of people who I, I call sickly saints. They are, they are people who are quite famous, who are not only famous uh, by name and accomplishment, but they become famous in religious and spiritual circles for their saintliness. And they die sometimes at an early age or from horrible diseases. Now this seems to defy the data, but remember we're talking about averages, so there are exceptions. For example, St. Bernadette who saw the vision at Lourdes where all the diseases uh, are reported to occasionally become cured at, in, in, in France, died at a young age of some disease we don't clearly understand, probably some form of tuberculosis. Ramana Maharshi is the most beloved saint in modern India, died a painful death of cancer. The Buddha uh, died of food poisoning. You, you can look it up. When I read this, I didn't believe it either, but historically, you wouldn't think that the Buddha would die of a, of a common disease such as food poisoning. My point is that we're talking averages here and there are exceptions. So being sickly on average is wonderful. Your, I mean, being spiritual is wonderful for your health, but it's not a guarantee. Now then, if you just take the sickly saint coin and turn it over, what you get is not sickly saints, you get healthy reprobates. This is the exact opposite. These are people who would never go to a church or synagogue uh, or a mosque and, and, and they defy all of the rules of good health that we advise people about. And they will smoke and they will drink to high heavens and they seem never to get sick. And they live long lives. I've about decided that every family has <laughs> has one or two of these characters somewhere uh, in the family. You know, you don't like to talk about them, and they're not nice to be around, but they're they're healthy. So, again, we're talking averages and not guarantees here. Now, lest you think that healthy rep reprobates are just sort of a, a, a man thing, uh, that's not true. The women get in on this too. These are two residents of London. Uh, I'm not sure if they're still alive, but this is what they look like uh, on their 100th uh, birthday, uh, smoking. And the woman on the right is not only smoking, but has some sort of liquor in her hand. But if you look closely, what you see around her neck is, some, is a crucifix. And I have wondered if, you know, that is evidence that she has some sort of spiritual mojo working for her that's protecting her and giving her a long life. So, what we can say 
is spirituality is connected with healing events. What do these events actually look like? Well, they're fascinating, and uh, uh, I would like to recommend a book to you that is full of these kinds of stories of uh, people who undergo, under spiritual influence, apparently, radical healings. Uh, these are what have been called miracle cases, and these are not published usually in medical literature. The reason is that nobody knows what to do with them. Uh, they don't show up in meta-analyses of uh, various illnesses because they're called outliers. They're off the, the, the curve of averages. And so here's how this book got published. Uh, Scott Kolbaba, whom you, hear see, you see here in this picture with his good friend, the dog, is an internist in the Wheaton, Illinois area and he did something I've never heard of before. He went around to the other doctors on the staff of the hospital and he said, I want you to write up for me the weirdest thing you have ever seen in your practice. And so he combined uh, these reports from his colleagues into this incredible book. It's been out for two or three years and uh, it's fascinating reading. Here is one of the cases. This had to do with a woman who uh, was reported by Dr. Thomas Marshall, who was on the staff of the hospital. He served as her internist for many years. And Barbara Comiskey uh, was a talented gymnast and flute player in high school in Wheaton. But at the age of 15, she developed severe multiple sclerosis. She was evaluated at one of the uh, major hospitals in the area, uh, the, uh, and nobody could stopped the disease, it, it, it progressed very rapidly. It got so bad that although she graduated high school and enrolled in college, she had to drop out because of her disabilities. She had two respiratory rests in the early 1970s. She developed recurrent pneumonia and had to be hospitalized time and time again. She had a collapsed lung in 1980. She had to have a tracheostomy in her throat for the delivery of oxygen to help her breathing. She lost total control of her bowel and bladder and wound up with an ileostomy to control her bowel movements and an indwelling urinary catheter. She lost her vision. She became legally blind. And although she was previously religious, she lost her faith. Well, things were going from bad to worse. Uh, she became bed bound. Uh, she was curled up like a pretzel with severe contractures uh, in a permanent fetal position. Because she couldn't swallow any longer, she had a t feeding tube inserted into her stomach from the outside. She was accepted into the hospice uh, facility. She was given only six months to live. And her family got together with Dr. Marshall, the doctor, and they agreed that there would be no CPR and no heroics when she died, which was predicted to be any moment. Well, here's what happened. On June 7th, uh, in 1981, there was a program on a local radio station, WBMI, MBI, where they asked for prayers for not only this woman who was widely known in the Quinton uh, area, but for all other people in the listening audience who were seriously and terminally ill, we know that there was an overwhelming response in prayers for this woman because later the radio station was just swamped with bags of letters uh, uh, wishing her well. And so the strangest thing happened. Here she was curled up like a pretzel in bed and uh, essentially doing her dying. And she reported to two women, two of her girlfriends who had come over to be with her that Sunday afternoon. She reported that she heard a man's voice saying, my child, get up and walk. Well, she said later she interpreted this, interpreted this as God speaking to her. And she did. For the first time in years, she, she jumped out of bed she took off of her, her oxygen and she stood on her legs for the first time in many, many years. 
oddly, her, her vision came back. She found out that she wasn't short of breath any longer off of oxygen. Her mother heard something going on in the bedroom and she came in and looked at Barbara and apparently Barbara's body had begun to change. Her mother said, you've got muscles again. Her father heard something going on and came into the room and saw her standing up and he hugged her and waltzed her around the room. Well, this was witnessed by her two girlfriends and uh, uh, they all decided that uh, that night they would go back to church. So here's the family going back to church Everyone was shocked because everyone knew she was dying. She walked up the center aisle uh, uh, to, to the, the pulpit where the minister was. The minister did not handle this well at all. He actually fell against the pulpit and he kept saying, this is nice. This is very nice. Uh, so they, they went back home and uh, the next day, they, the family took her to see Dr. Marshall, who was an internist of many years. And this is what he wrote up and delivered to Dr. Kolbaba, who put this book together. He said, I thought I was seeing an apparition. Here was my patient who was not expected to live another week, totally cured. I stopped all of her medication and took out her bladder catheter, but she wasn't quite ready to have the trach tube removed until another visit. No one had ever seen anything like this before. That afternoon, we sent Barbara for a chest x-ray. Her lungs were now perfectly normal with the collapsed lung totally expanded with no infiltrate or other abnormality that had existed before. And he said, I've never witnessed anything like this, this before or since. Barbara has gone on, he says, to live a normal life in every way. She subsequently married a minister, and she feels her calling in life is to serve others. Now, this is Barbara after she's married. She's Barbara Comis Comiskey Snyder now. If you go to the internet and tap in Barbara Comiskey, you can find uh, this story. It's all over the internet, and it's extraordinarily inspiring, and it's also mysterious. This is the sort of thing that isn't written up in medical literature. You can read quick. Uh, case histories of multiple sclerosis, and these things are just invisible. Now, where do we go with these sorts of cases? Well, this woman was near death. I, I happen to believe that all forms of healing ought to include some vision of consciousness of life and death and the hereafter, because this was what this woman was facing. And the question I want to ask with you is, if we were to develop that sort of vision, what would it look like? Well, it's pretty dismal. Because in conventional science for many years, we have said that consciousness is perishable. Why is that? Well, we say that it's a function of the brain. And when the brain and body die, and because death is final, there really is no hereafter for consciousness. It's, it's totally perishable. And so here's the conclusion I've come to after several decades of practicing internal medicine. I happen to believe that the fear of total annihilation with death, that there is no hereafter, that when you're dead, that's, there isn't anything else. I think that has caused more suffering in human history than all the physical diseases combined. Now, there are a lot of people who don't agree. One who kind of laughs at this is Sogyal Rinpoche, who wrote this wonderful book, The Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. And uh, Sogyal Rinpoche says, not to worry, we will all die successfully. That's supposed to be funny, but I don't think it's very humorous. Michel de Montaigne, the, the great French essayist in the 16th century, if you don't know how to die, don't worry. Nature will tell you what to do on the spot fully and adequately. She will do this job perfectly for you. So don't bother your head about it. So this is the don't worry approach. Well, a lot of people do worry about this. I think it's foolish to deny that. An example is Tom Ford, the, the famous fashion, New York fashion designer. 
death is all I think about. There's not a day or an hour that goes by that I don't think about death. I think this is a pretty common uh, response. Now, many of you may remember back to the 1970s when this book published and it won the Nobel Prize, the Pulitzer Prize, I should say, for, for nonfiction. It was written by Ernest Becker, the famous psychologist, called The Denial of Death. And it was sort of an in-your-face description of all the ways that Americans deny the reality of death. Now, this triggered a lot of what I call nervous humor. Uh, Woody Allen said, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve immortality through not dying. I don't want to live on in the hearts of my countrymen. I want to live on in my apartment. And th these comments were just uh, all over the media. Su Susan Ertz, a British novelist, had written, millions long for immortality who don't know what to do on a rainy afternoon. And uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, jazz uh, guitarists and, and singers is Albert King. Albert said, everybody wants to get, go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. So this was an attempt to kind of laugh about this uh, uh, dismal conclusion that when uh, uh, when you die, that, that's really all there is. And uh, so it sort of takes us back to the question of, is there a soul or not? I mean, is there any hope for immortality? I think that uh, there are many pathways that you could follow if you want to try to provide a, a suitable answer for this question. Uh, here are a few of the paths that people have taken. Uh, very common is just a religious path, you know, just what my religion tells me is what I want to believe. For these people, the uh, scriptural dictate, the scriptural record and issues of faith and revelation are all that they, they need to answer this question about whether or not there is a soul. And also people, some people rely heavily on mediums who presumably channel information for people who have died, providing evidence there is something more. This near-death experience category is one that I'm fascinated by, in part because there are 15 million Americans who say they have had near-death experiences in which they have profound revelations of what it is like to experience the hereafter. And then there are these children that you read about commonly who began between the age of two and six to talk about having lived a previous life before being reincarnated in this one. There's a huge literature on, on, on those kind of examples. But for me, I, I'm most attracted in answering the question about the soul, about uh, what the research shows, what Anna has al already alluded to. Now, this is not a new question, trying to struggle through this question of recurring, recovering the soul and whether or not there's anything after death. One of the people in the 20th century who was most fearless in approaching this question was Carl Jung, the great psychiatrist. The decisive question for man is, is he related to something or not, infinite or not? That is the telling question of his life. He went on to say, a man should be able to say he has done his best to form a conception of life after death or to create some image of it, even if he has to confess his failure. Not to have done so is a vital loss. Jung was so convinced of the importance of coming to grips with this question that he made this a principle in his therapy with his patients. He said, as a doctor, I make every effort to strengthen the belief in immortality. Well, it all comes down to, I think, this question. What the heck is consciousness? What is it that we presume survives death if, in fact, it does? What are we talking about when we talk about the soul and what 
are we talking about when we invoke this term consciousness? Well, I've given you some hints already about how conventional science sees this. Conventional science for at least two centuries has equated consciousness in the mind with the brain. Now, scientists have struggled with this, and I think you have to say that the overall conclusion for the past two centuries has been that nothing survives the death of the brain and body. Uh, people, sometimes scientists make clever jokes about this. One of these is uh, Marvin Minsky, who for many years ran the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at MIT. He says that the brain is just a computer made out of meat. Cozy little point of view. Uh, I mean, you could multiply this view endlessly. Uh, uh, physicists have gotten in on this material view of the non-reality of consciousness and mind uh, and have said that there's no direction or purpose or meaning in the universe as a whole. Uh, an example is David Lindley, the famous astrophysicist currently working. We're just, we humans are just crumbs of organic matter clinging to the surface of one tiny rock. Cosmically, we are no more significant than mold on a shower curtain. It's a pretty dismal outlook, this idea that mind equals brain and that you are your body and nothing more than that because you're led to say that when your body dies, all that you dies with it and absolutely nothing survives. So this dominant point of view in conventional science is why we are obligated in my judgment to do what we can to recover the soul. Now, there is an emerging uh, body of science that I, I want you to become aware of. There are a couple of websites that if you want to uh, explore them, they will give you all sorts of evidence that is relevant to this question. Can we recover the soul? The Academy for the Advancement of Post-Material Science, Sciences has just been formed. Here's the website. Uh, there's another website, Open Sciences. There's an S there, opensciences.org where you can download all sorts of papers and studies which can give you some ammunition that you can personally use in confronting this issue about whether anything survives death. Now, there's a great misunderstanding, I believe, among the scientists about what science says about this. If you read deeply into the scientific literature, you will discover immediately there have been outstanding sciences and scientists in the 20th century who have said this idea that there's nothing more after death is premature. We are not justified, even within science, of taking this morbid view. Among these is Stuart Kaufman, who is a famous theoretical biologist. No, nobody has the faintest idea of what consciousness is. I don't have anybody, I don't have any idea, nor does anybody else, including the philosophers of mind. You can multiply these positions endlessly, collecting them as a hobby of mine. Donald Hoffman is one of my favorite cognitive scientists. He's at the University of California, Irvine. The scientific study of consciousness is in the embarrassing position of having no scientific theory of consciousness. Freeman Dyson is one of the most famous scientists working today. He's at Cornell. The origin of life is a total mystery, and so is the existence of consciousness. Now, I don't have time to show you any more of these, this outpouring of this position among famous scientists, but you can explore this literature yourself if you're interested in those websites I mentioned. So where are we headed? This is where we, we're headed. We're looking toward an emerging view of consciousness that is non-local. Don't be scared of this word non-local. It, it's about as complicated as you want to make it. If you just substitute the word infinite for this word non-local, 
then you'll be doing okay. If consciousness is infinite, then it doesn't have any boundaries. We're talking about infinite consciousness here, and consciousness can be infinite in two ways. It can be if infinite in space, and if it's infinite or non-local in space, it's present everywhere, right? No boundaries in space. And it's infinite in time, it's eternal and immortal, because you can't confine it to specific points in time, like a human single life. And so this idea of non-local or infinite mind puts us in a bit position to make observations that we would otherwise not see, we would be blind to, such as the fact that consciousness is simply capable of doing things that brains cannot do. Consciousness can function non-locally, infinitely, at a distance outside the brain because consciousness is not confined to the brain and body nor to the present. Carl Jung, the great psychiatrist, was all over this idea. He didn't use the word non-local because it was not currently in fashion, but he talked about the collective aspects of mind. And this is one of the uh, results of thinking non-locally. If consciousness can't be bounded and put in a box in space or time and a brain or body, then it doesn't have any boundaries to it so that in some dimension, consciousness must come together in unity with all those other consciousnesses that are out there. This point of view has never been a mystery to poets. William Butler Yeats put it this way, the borders of our memories are shifting and our memories are part of one great memory. The borders of our minds are ever shifting and many minds can flow into one another and reveal a single mind, a single energy. Now, people who don't, who, scientists who don't like this point of view often say, uh, well, no decent scientist would ever believe any of that stuff. I mean, that's just something that probably was made up by dope, dope smoking hippies in Southern California back in the 60s. So good scientists would never talk like this. We'll just leave that to the poets and the hippies. That is an erroneous view, to put it mildly. Erwin Schrodinger, who, uh, whose name is uh, known widely in uh, quantum physics, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1933 for his contributions to something called the Schrodinger wave equations in quantum physics, said, Consciousness is a singular entity, a singular tanta. To divide or multiply consciousness is something meaningless. He went on to say, there is obviously only one alternative, namely the unifications, the unification of minds or consciousness. The overall number of minds is just one. In truth, there is only one mind. Why does he say that? Well, he's onto this idea that consciousness is non-local. It has no boundaries. It's essentially immortal in time because it's unbounded in time. And it unites as one mind, a unification of consciousness because it's non-local in space. You can't wall it off from all the other consciousnesses that are out there. Now, There's a great book out. <laughs> there is a great book out there that if you want to talk about these uh, issues and among yourselves or think about this, thank you, Anna. <laughs> uh, this book explores the reasoning that we've just hit the high spots of, and if you want to see the comments that have been rendered by some of the world's great physicists, that's uh, cordial with this idea. Then this is a a place to go. So the view that is emerging in what I want to call new science is that consciousness is independent of the brain. It works through the brain, but it isn't produced by the brain and it cannot be explained 
by the brain. If you pursue the literature, you'll find out that this idea that the brain transmits consciousness but doesn't make it is on record and the writings of just more admirable scientists and philosophers that I could even list here. Here are a few of them. So the image that I carry around in my mind about how this works is that the brain transmits consciousness, sort of like a prism transmits light. The, the prism doesn't make the light that comes through it. It just refracts it and changes it and modifies it. Uh, and the light emerges in a different form. Max Planck, who founded modern quantum physics, put it this way, I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard consciousness as derivative, excuse me, I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. We cannot get behind consciousness. For goodness sakes, this is the man who founded quantum mechanics, quantum physics. Everything that we talk about, everything that we regard as existing postulates consciousness. So I want to explore with you uh, what these, uh, these non-local events uh, sort of look like in, in real life. Let's put some flesh and bones uh, onto these ideas. There's a uh, collection of events that have been collected by psychologists mostly uh, over the past few decades that are called telesomatic events. Uh, this, is, this is what they look like. Uh, this is uh, an, an event that was recorded in northern Spain in 1976 and was investigated by a team of psychologists from the University of Madrid and written up in the literature. It had, had to do with identical twins. They were four-year-old little girls, Sylvia and Marta Landa. And here's what happened. One day, the father wanted to take the twins off to visit the grandparents who were many miles away. But uh, one of the little girls didn't want to go. She wanted to stay home and help her mother with household chores. So one little girl goes to see the grandparents, the other stays home to help her mom. Unfortunately, in helping her mother with household duties, she stuck her hand to a red hot iron and erupted in a second degree blister, a second degree burn, sort of like the one you see here. And as it turned out, her identical twin sister who was off at the grandparents, at the same time, erupted in a second degree burn on the same hand, in the same configuration, the same pattern. Although the twins did not know what was happening between them. Now, what do you, how do you understand that? Well, uh, there's a whole literature around this, so these telesomatic events. What we know is that this doesn't happen between all twins. About 20% of identical twins experience this sort of thing. Now, uh, one of the uh, things I've done is to uh, investigate some of these happenings. These, these are twin boys. Uh, they, they're, they're from London. This is three or four years old. Uh, they have a huge following on Facebook. Uh, as far as I can tell, most of their followers are teenage girls, and uh, they're having fun with this idea that their minds seem to be connected here with this tinfoil bridge between their tinfoil helmets. Uh, here's another couple. The point here is that these kids who, these not Eagle twins who have these distant correlated uh, sensations and findings, have a quality that is necessary for these things to occur. They have to enjoy being twins. They have to feel emotionally close. All identical twins don't feel emotionally close. 
But those who do are those who are more likely, like these two little girls, I would predict they're great candidates for this sort of thing. Uh, but when you get right down to it, the literature shows that non-twins, non-twins who are emotionally close also experience these distant correlated findings. This includes parents and children, spouses, siblings, and lovers. There's a book that goes into all of these cases. If you want your mind blown about some of these cases, this book should do it. It's written by a, a British researcher, Guy Playfair, Twin Telepathy, the Psychic Connection. Now, I must confess to you that I have a personal interest in this body of distant, non-local happenings between identical twins because I happen to be an identical twin. Uh, this is, uh, my, my mother would be very happy that I'm showing the baby pictures here, but this, th this is my twin brother, Gary, and me. Uh, he's a dentist. Uh, he went to dental school. I went to medical school. And we've had these telesomatic things all of our life. So when we were growing up, we, we didn't know that there was anything particularly abnormal or peculiar about this. We, we just call this twin stuff. And, and we just, you know, we were amused by it and just sort of went, went on with things. Uh, we didn't stop to wonder about it. And I'm also interested in this for another reason. I happen to be married to a, to a twin. This is my wife, Barbara, uh, who's written, I forget how many textbooks in cardiovascular and holistic nursing that are used in nursing schools around the country. This is her and her uh, twin brother at uh, 18 months, and she and her twin brother, although obviously not identical twins, fraternal twins instead, they have had sensational uh, telesomatic exchanges and correlated feelings and physical symptoms. So our household is <laughs> our household has been a kind of like a, a twin laboratory uh, over the years with these things going on. Now. How does all this apply to healing? Uh, well, I, I think they help us understand how certain forms of healing happen. Uh, they help us understand how non-local feelings, non-local intentions can make a difference in a distant body, for example. So I hope you can begin to see the correlations between these tele telesomatic events. Uh, the evidence for non-local healing, distant healing, comes in several forms. First of all, there are the human studies, sort of like the Barbara Comiskey case I presented. And then there are spontaneous healings, uh, and then there are non-human and uh, laboratory experiments. And I don't want to go into it because we don't have time to spend looking at, at each one of these in any depth. I just want to give you a feel for each of them starting with these non-human laboratory experiments, which I think are extremely important. They give us evidence that our non-local unity and oneness exist not just between whole human beings, such as with the Lambda twins uh, and the telesomatic events. If you go down to the cellular level, you can see that this non-local unity exists as well. Here's one example of this in action, and this has been published uh, widely. Uh, it was done at uh, the University of Milan by Rita Pizzi and her colleagues. They took two batches of human neurons, brain neurons, and they separated them at some distance and they put them in shielded containers so that there would be no known way for these two batches of neurons to communicate with each other. And uh, they stimulated one batch of neurons with a laser light. And at the same instant, the other shielded neurons at a distance responded exactly at the same time in the same way. Evidence that somehow there's some sort of non-local communication between these two cellular 
uh, uh, entities that were taken as biopsies from human beings. Dr. Pizzi says this, and here's the website where you can read about this study. It's on the NASA website because NASA became very interested in this sort of stuff. Our experimental data seem to strongly suggest that biological systems present non-local properties not explainable by classical models. I could multiply these cellular experiments showing distant unity ad infinitum. Because we don't have time, I want to show you that they have been replicated not between people or people people's cells, but within other entities in their interaction with peoples. People have interacted with fungi in the laboratory and uh, replication rates of uh, bacteria and test tubes. They have interacted with the growth rates and of seedlings and the germination rate of seeds in the laboratory. And most importantly, I think, is the interaction with human beings and their intentions in healing problems in animals. Now, the uh, uh, interesting study here, uh, the interesting studies show that these experiments overcome the common objection of skeptics toward this whole area in people. They will say that if a person at a distance gets well on account of your intentions, your intentions really had nothing to do that with that. This was just the placebo effect. The person knew you were praying for them or intending that they get well, and so they used the power of positive thinking, suggestion, and expectation, and got well on their own, but your thoughts and intentions had nothing to do with this. If you see these experiments in distant healing in animals and plants and microbes happening at a distance, you can be pretty sure that this was not due to the placebo response. Because as far as we know, plants, animals, seedlings, bacteria, and fungi don't have a placebo response. Or if they do, it's not nearly as dramatic as in human beings. Here's the go-to book. If you want a book that's written for lay people, Dr. Bill Bingston now has replicated these studies in healing cancer in mice by people's intentions in 16 different replicated experiments. And you can look up Bill Bingston, Dr. William Bingston on the internet. You can find all of these studies and look at them to your satisfaction. Now, we don't have time for, to look at this in any detail, but I just want you to understand how sensational this evidence is. The mice are transplanted with human breast cancer, mammary cancer, and this is a terrible thing to do to mice because within 30 days, the mice who have the transplanted breast cancer are all dead. There is no survival rate. But when he teaches people how to do the healing technique at a distance, then these mice have spontaneous cures and remissions uh, up to 90% uh, as a result of these uh, healing intentions according to this technique. He has even taught non-believers to do this. He's used cynical college sophomores from his classes who don't believe any of this stuff, but as long as they use the technique, they can heal the mice just as well as believers do. This is sensational evidence, and I hope you will take the time to check out the description of these phenomena in the book, The Energy Cure. Well, there are all sorts of other studies I could mention. However, I just want to say that if you want to look at a published so-called meta-analysis of this whole field, looking at studies in humans and non-humans alike, this is the place to go. This looks at 57 studies involving people, 49 studies involving non-people, bacteria, cells, animals, and plants. Uh, in, in summary, I'll, I'll just say that this stuff works. And skeptics who say, you know, this, there's no evidence for this non-local distant healing phenomenon is simply wrong. I want to show that this has relevance in human culture aside from health and healing. And I want to show you some evidence from the field of creativity 
where this unitary collective non-local mind makes a difference. Now, there have been several people who have said that if minds come together, maybe there's a collective consciousness out there with, uh, into which individuals under certain circumstances might tap into it, and they might, so to speak, download this pool of information into their own work and into their own productivity. Now, this has been hypothesized by many people, among who was Ralph Waldo Emerson, who talked about the oversoul as a uh, source of creativity. But the person I want to center on is people who have considered, have been considered extremely creative in their life. Many people consider Thomas Edison the most productive American scientist in history. Be that as it may, here, here's, what, here's what Edison said. People say, I've created things. I've never created anything. I get impressions from the universe at large and work them out. I, but I am only a plate on a record or a receiving apparatus, and thoughts are really impressions that we get from the outside. So people, when they think that, well, he was just very clever using his neurons to think this stuff up, he had a different view. It came from the outside. These downloaded, <laughs> well, I hate to use the computer language, but I don't, I think it's pretty apt. Uh, the, the, the downloading from the outside is particularly dramatic when it happens, not just in adults, but in, in children. Uh, here's one example of this in action. Uh, this comes from Joseph Chilton Pierce, who was a developmental psychologist. In his younger years, uh, in his early 30s, he was teaching humanities in, in a college. And as he put it, he was just engrossed, uh, carried away with trying to understand the nature of the relationship between God and human beings. And he was infatuated with the psychology of Carl Jung, whom we've already alluded to. And so here, here, here's what, was ha what happened to him one morning. He was preparing for an early morning college class, and uh, he was going through his notes in his bedroom, and his five-year-old son came into the bedroom and sat down on the edge of the bed, and this five-year-old boy launched into uh, a 20-minute discussion on the relationship between God and, and human beings. Here's, here's what Pierce wrote. My son spoke in perfect publishable sentences without any pause or haste and in a flat monotone. He used complex theological terminology and he told me it seemed everything there was to know. He's five. As I listened, astonished, the hair rose on my neck. I felt goosebumps and finally tears streamed down my face I was in the midst of the uncanny, the inexplicable. My son's ride to kindergarten, to kindergarten arrived, horn blowing, and he got up and left. I was unnerved and arrived late to my class. My five-year-old son had no recollection of this event. I want to finish with referring to uh, what I think are some ethical issues that flow from this idea of non-local consciousness and a moral aspect of who we are that's infinite in space and time. I think that if in fact we are all connected on some level that there is always a global collective aspect to what we call personal health. So personal health, if we're united, is never just personal. If our consciousness is unitary, then the health of one person has to affect the health of everybody else. So that the health of this beautiful Western 
world baby on the left is never totally distinct from the health of these three children on the right. There are three of them. The little girl is holding a baby in this refugee camp in, in East Africa. So individual health just reverberates non-locally at all levels so that there's overlap and in interpenetration between the individual, the societal, and the global health. This permits us, I think, to, to upgrade the golden rule, which usually is stated in this form, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We can upgrade it to something like this. Be kind to others because in some sense, they are you. Ramana Maharshi, the most beloved saint in modern India, was once asked, how, how should we treat others? His response is, there are no others. So I think our ideas affect, affect our behavior in many, many ways on this planet. And I believe that our survival on this fragile planet is going to depend on how deeply we experience our unity and our oneness and our collectivity with other living things. The key realization, I think, is that we're non-locally connected, not only with other humans, but with all sentient life. And when we deeply realize this, all of life becomes sacred and precious and deserving to be saved. So I want to propose to you that this idea of the unitary one mind goes far beyond any sort of healing application to the healing of the earth itself and to the salvation of human beings on this planet. I suggest that this unitary one mind, by fostering love and deep caring for all of sentient life and the earth itself, may assist our own survival. And so the end, in the end, what we're talking about here is not too complicated. It's all about love. Albert Schweitzer won the Nobel Peace, Peace Prize in 1952 and said basically what we've, we've been talking about here. What we call love is, in its essence, reverence for life. It includes all living beings. W.H. Auden, the great poet, said this in 1933, as if foreseeing the future, we must love one another or die. And Alice Walker, the African-American great novelist, anything we love can be saved. Aldous Huxley was dying in his home in Southern California, and there were a lot of people and friends who came to be near him. So he was in the back room dying, doing his dying, and the people out front nominated ambas an ambassador to go back and ask him a question. And the question was, do you have any advice for those of us who will be left behind? And this is what he said. People often ask me what is the most effective technique for transforming their life. It is a little embarrassing that after years and years of research and experimentation, I have to say that the best answer is just be a little kinder. Henry James, and we're about finished here. Henry James, the great novelist, was the brother of William James, the founder of modern psychology in the US. And he wrote, three things in human life are important. The first is to be kind. The second is to be kind. And the third is to be kind. Okay, I, I wanna summarize this and then I'm done. 
there's extensive research that shows that our consciousness is non-local or infinite in space and time. Therefore, it's eternal, immortal, and united or one. The scientific evidence for non-local mind not only permits immortality, it absolutely requires it. Immortality is not merely optional, it is absolutely mandatory from what we know. Immortality is not acquired. It has no beginning or end. It doesn't just kick in when you die. It is always present. So that we are all immortal right now. I want to leave you with just a few lines of poetry from the 14th century fabulous Persian poet Hafiz. Let's go deeper, go deeper. For if we do, our spirits will embrace and interweave. Our union will be so glorious that even God will not be able to tell us apart. That's fascinating. Uh, so, uh, I'm, I'm fascinating. Thank you so much, Dr. Darcy, for this wonderful presentation. I'm pretty sure that everybody enjoyed. And uh, as of now, we will open for uh, questions and answers. So, we have a little bit of uh, uh, 10 minutes before the next session. Uh, but before then, uh, let me tell uh, that we will we'll, we'll do, we did a surprise for all of you, for the audience. So we are going to do a, like a, a raffle. So we are going to uh, raffle the uh, book from Dr. Darcy, uh, One Mind. So we had about 1,327 um, people registered. And uh, we will um, do a quick, uh, it's going to be like a, an online raffle. And uh, we, I do not know who is going to be the lucky guy, but uh, whoever's going to be, we will uh, send you an email. And uh, so you can please send me uh, your, uh, your address so I can send this book to you. So one line from uh, Dr. Dossi, wonderful book, I think. fascinating. So for now we open for a Q&A. So whoever has a, a, a question for Dr. Dossi, so go ahead and type here a question on the Q&A. Uh, uh, you, you see a Q&A button. But I do have some questions that uh, I got from a uh, few folks. Uh, who, who registered and, and sent to us something before them. Uh, the first one that I have here is, uh, uh, what is your definition for uh, the word prayer? Prayer? Uh, I'm, you know, there's something happened in our uh, audio and I, I can barely understand you, but I think you asked me about my definition about prayer? Yes. Okay. Am I coming through to you? Can you understand me? I can, I can hear you very well. Okay. Well, I wrote a book about uh, prayer called Healing Words uh, once and uh, had to define prayer because that was the topic of the book. And I was astonished that uh, there are endless definitions of prayer. Uh, I tried to filter all these down to a common denominator, and my definition for prayer is pretty simple. For me, prayer is just communication with the absolute. That satisfies almost nobody because you're stuck then with having to answer, well, what do you mean by communication? And so what, what is this thing you're calling the absolute? Well, this is, uh, this does not nail it down. And I leave this uh, 
as an open-ended thing that people can identify for themselves. Uh, I think communication might take the form of spoken words. It can take the form of ritual that can be elaborate or entirely simple. You know, the Hindus in Advaita Hinduism have this idea that intentionality, which we often attach to prayer, you pray for something, so you intend something, but in Advaita Buddhism, uh, Hinduism, there are different levels of intentionality mm -hmm. and conscious intention that you might use consciously through intending in prayer is only one way of intending. There are at least four different levels. And at one level, intention is entirely unconscious. And there are a lot of Hindu scholars who say that is the most important and most potent form of intending there is. So if you want to pray out loud, have at it. And if you want to spell it out and say what you want or wish or intend for someone else, I'm all for that. But I think that prayer is multifaceted. And uh, I think sometimes it's best that we leave it alone and don't force it into a box. Uh, and I, I think that fits my, my definition better than spelling out what it is in, in great detail. You know, I, I, when you spell out what prayer is, you're going to leave somebody out and they're going to be offended and get their backs up and say, well, you don't really think I'm praying, but you don't know what's in my heart or my, my the consciousness. So I just want to leave it <laughs> really open-ended and say, you find out for yourself what prayer is. That's wonderful, yes. When I do prayer in my, my original language is Portuguese, I cannot pray in another language. It has to be my own because it has to be from my heart. There you go. I have friends uh, who are great outdoorsmen and my wife go and I go up in the mountains camping every, uh, backpacking every, every summer. With some of the people we go backpacking with say, well, this is my annual prayer trip. And they say, I never feel closer to the transcendent than when I'm outdoors in the mountains where there's no nobody around and I can commune more effectively that way than any other way. So this is what we call backpacking prayer or uh, nature prayer. I mean, this is a fairly common way in uh, world religions of getting closer to the absolute being exposed to, to, to nature where there's nothing around to impede your access to the transcendent. <laughs> that's, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, well, um, I would love to continue the conversation, but my timekeeper is telling me that I have uh, two minutes to go. <laughs> and I have over here I have at least eight more questions. So uh, if you don't mind, I'd love to send those questions to you and uh, perhaps you can answer to us so we can uh, uh, publish them in the website. But uh, I would like, as of now, I'd like to say thank you so much, Dr. Dossi. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful presentation. Well, you've been wonderful uh, and I am deeply honored to do this. And I want to say to all you listeners and watchers, whatever country you're in, I thank you for taking time out of your busy lives to attend this webinar. It means a lot to me personally. Yeah, I must say we have people from Japan, Hawaii, Canada, Singapore, Australia, 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 so thank, thank you. you so much, Dr. Dossi, and I hope to see you another time. Thank you.